everybody. I am so happy you chose to join us again on our Mount Sinai NBC of Memphis Incorporated YouTube page. Let us pray. Most holy and fa gracious Father, we come now to thank you for another opportunity to hear from you. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that as your word goes forward, that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. We love you and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. So we are studying the articles of faith and we are on article number 13, which is a gospel church. And our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by the covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ governed by his laws and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that its only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistles to Timothy and Titus. And so our scripture uh, continues to come from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. And again today, we will only read verses 4 through 6, and it's coming from the NIV version. So 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 4 through 6, NIV, says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. So we have in times past mentioned the immorality of the church at Corinth. You know the one that begins with a capital S, but that was not their only problem. There were a host of other problems. The book of the, the letters, the first and second Corinthians, uh, mention all the problems. First Corinthians is, is like a, a frequently asked question type letter. You know, Paul just kind of, uh, it, it's like he has a list of questions that they were wanting answered, and he just kind of goes through the list. It's like, like he's got, uh, a PowerPoint and he goes through the list, but the church, uh, they were a church that was divided, which means that they had envy and strife and contention that it, it, all that was just prevalent in the church. They were a church with many spiritual gifts that were being used, but they also, the, the gifts brought with them a competitive spirit. Now the gifts didn't do that. The people that received the gift uh, had a competitive spirit. Everybody wanted what was considered to be the best gifts. They were a church where the members were suing each other a lot and taking advantage of each other. A, a church where divorce was rampant. A, a church where people would get drunk at the communion services. And, and, and the women were speaking out of turn and disrupting the service. For all of you out there that are thinking, what's wrong with women speaking out? I say, stay in the culture of that time. And I will point out that it is disruptive in any era to speak out of turn and disrupt the service. You would think that a church like that would have terrible teachers or no teachers at all, but that's not so. They had a great heritage and had many great teachers of the word. And it was a church for the most part that was characterized by right doctrine. All things considered, we can see why the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, is included in this book. They clearly were lacking a love relationship with each other. Y'all, as I study the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, I am seeing that church in a whole different light. 
And it's making me excited about the Holy, what the Holy Spirit is going to reveal about them and mainly what he's going to reveal about me. And I pray that it's doing the same for you. In our verses, Paul points out that they had been enriched in every way. They had in them already everything needed to live out the Christian life. Can you just stop and think about that for a moment? And repeat after me. I have everything I need to live out the Christian life. I have it right now. That means that I'm not lacking. Now, that doesn't mean that I can sit back and do nothing. You know, I can be hungry with a food with with food in the freezer. It it, it does mean the food in the freezer does me no good unless I throw it out, cook it, and eat it. And, and so last time we went to the epistle of Second Peter to read how Peter stated pretty much the same thing. Uh, Second Peter, the first chapter, verses 3 through 4, again, the NIV. It says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Peter says, that God has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We just need to take advantage of what God has given us. First, he has given us his word. Only from his word do we get the true knowledge of him who called us. Through his word comes the message of the gospel without which we cannot be saved. Paul says in Romans 1 and 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. The power is in the word of God. He says it's in the gospel first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And, and then next, God has given us his promises. Verse four says, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So we can have hope in God's promises. Why, you ask? Can I have hope in his promises? Well, thank you for asking. We can have hope in God's promises because he cannot lie. Hebrews 6 and 18 tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. Hope in God is an anchor for our souls. It keeps us grounded. It holds us down. There is comfort in knowing that God's promises do not depend on our character, but on his faithfulness. Think about the promise made to Abraham. In spite of Abraham's failure and sins, God kept his promise and Isaac was born. Many of God's promises do not depend on our character, but on his faithfulness. But there are some that require us to do our part. We must diligently apply ourselves to develop our spiritual life. We got to do something. The farmer does not reap a harvest by sitting on the porch and watching the seed and, you know, saying, wow, the seed really looks good. No, he must get busy plow the ground, plant the seed, weed out the, get out the weeds, cultivate and water the soil. So as believers, when we neglect church fellowship, whether it's in person 
or in our era uh, of the pandemic online, when we ignore the Bible and forget to pray, when when we we are not when we do those things, when we just pretty much put the Bible on the shelf or or uh, think don't even think about it or, or don't even think to pray, we're not going to reap much of a harvest. Peter tells us that we are to add to our faith. God makes salvation possible, but we have our part to play. Peter tells us to make every effort to add to your faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. The effort that he speaks of is the same effort that is applied in childbirth. Even if you have never given birth, you know the word that is used. And the force behind the word is push. You can't be slowful in childbirth, even if you want to be. The event itself will force you to make every effort. Push your homework. Yeah, you got homework today. Is to read 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses 5 through 8. And every time you're told to add equality to your faith, think the word push. Each addition requires a new birth. Push. Then in verse 8, he says, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which, when all was said and done, that was the issue in the, in the church at Corinth. They had knowledge of Jesus, and they were saved, but they were ineffective and unproductive, which resulted in the church being in chaos. We know they were saved because Paul in our text in verse 6 says, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. He is saying that as far as he can see, they genuinely believed in, in the teaching that they had had, uh, in the teaching that he had done, and they received it. He, Paul is assured that they have trusted in Christ for their salvation. Their speech and knowledge among other gifts show that they have received God's grace through faith in Christ. The Corinthians believers didn't lack any spiritual gifts. In fact, they stood equal with the strongest churches. They had they they, they not only had personal gifts of faith and, and knowledge and tongues, but they also had public gifts such as miracles and healing and prophecies. And, and they possessed these gifts in abundance. That tells me that a person's gifts does not mean that he is necessarily strong in the Lord. We've all seen it. A person that God has given tremendous gifts and they abuse it. We've seen stars with great gifts and they end up destroyed. We, we've seen families that it, it just seemed like everybody in the family got a gift, that everybody can do something. And yet they are destroyed because of it. And, and we think a lot of times, if I just had just a smidgen of that, of what they had, I could do so much. But you should ask yourself, what am I doing with my one talent? That pretty much tells me what I would do if I had lots of them. Even though there were major issues in the church, Paul had no doubt that they were saved. That, that should remind us that just because folk are acting badly does not mean that they are not true believers in Jesus Christ. Don't look at my shortcoming. And decide that ah oh, she ain't got nothing. That she's not saved or he's not saved. God has given us everything we need for life 
and godliness. But it is given through our knowledge of him. Through our knowledge of him, we learn of his glory and, and, and his goodness. And through his glory and his goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises. And he does it all that so that we may participate in his divine nature, which allows us to escape the corruption in the world that is caused by evil desires. All the corruption that's going on in the world and in me is caused by evil desires. That tells me that there is a way to escape the world's corruptions, that I don't have to just accept it. I can escape. There is a way to escape. Well, that's all I have for today. Join us again next time as we continue to discuss our article of faith, which is article number 13, a gospel church. And until then, be blessed and see you next time. Bye-bye.